So, welcome to the second lecture regarding the ABC transporters and the related diseases, uh, which was given to us by Dr. Kathleen Gota. Now, let's get to it. First of all, before we talk about ABC transporters themselves, if you remember, uh, in, the uh, in the second lecture, actually, uh, which we did as the first video, we talked about different types of active transport. And when we were talking about primary or ATP-driven active transport, we said we have different types of active transporters, P-type, V-type, F-type, and ABC transporters, which we're going to talk about these ABC transporters now. But let's just review what we said about P, V, and F type. Well, P type AD, uh, ATPases, like sodium potassium pump, like calcium pump, which are uh, these pumps, these ATPases, are transiently phosphorylated by covalent bonds, and that's how. They work, whereas V-type ATPases, they don't get phosphorylated covalently, and that's the big difference here. And the example of V-type ATPase is the proton ATPase in the membrane of endosome or lysosome, which is responsible for keeping uh, the lumen of lysosome, for example, acidic uh, because of the big concentration of uh, proton in it. And I, I think I forgot to mention the, the difference between F-type and V-type. Well, F-type, we basically will only study one example of it, and that is uh, the F-type uh, complex uh, 5 in the inner membrane of mitochondria, which is also known as ATP synthase complex. Well, uh, the difference here is that ATP synthase complex, as the name suggests, doesn't hydrolyze ATP, but actually produces ATP. And you don't need to know more about ATP synthase complex now, because we need to talk about it in a lecture about mitochondria. So now let's get to ABC transporters, or ABC proteins in general. To understand ABC proteins, first we need to know their uh, structure and uh, uh, what are they built from. So each, ATP, uh, each ABC protein is formed by two uh, transmembrane, two transmembrane domains or TMDs, these two in the two-dimensional form or here in three-dimensional form, uh, which collectively form the substrate binding site. So the substrate of these proteins will bind to these transmembrane domains. And they also have, these red ones, two binding sites, two ATP binding sites, or NBDs, which NBD stands for nucleotide binding site, because ATP has got adenosine, which has got a nucleotide, so they just wrote NBD instead of A. Uh, BD, and these NBDs or ATP binding sites are responsible for binding and hydrolysis hydrolo of ATP. So basically how these ABC proteins work is that first this ATP binding site gets phosphorylated by ATP and this phosphorylation will cause, us, as usual, the conformational change within the whole protein and the affinity of these transmembrane domains or substrate binding sites toward the substrate will change and so the ABC proteins can perform uh, whatever they're going to perform. And one more thing about their structure is that the ATP binding sites are built from evolutionary conserved amino acid sequences. What does it mean? It means that the ATP binding sites you see here, during evolution, their structure and function in different species has been conserved. What it means, in another word, is that the structure and the mechanism of ATP hydrolysis, 
is shared among the ABC proteins. So what makes the ATP proteins different is not their ATP binding domains, but their transmembrane or substrate binding sites. And here, this slide is to simply uh, show the difference between the prokaryote and eukaryote ABC transporters. Because you can see here, bacteria, the ABC transporters in bacteria can be either exporters or importers. The exporters will do the same things as they a lot of them do in eukaryotic cells. They export the toxic substances like antibiotics. But importers uptake of amino acids, irons, mono or polysaccharides, basically what cells need to thrive. But that is only in case of some bacteria, some prokaryotic cells. And you can see here the uh, membrane of a bacteria, if you remember a gram-negative bacterium. And you can see the ABC uh, transporters do both import and export. But in case of eukaryotic cells, in case of like human cells, the ABC transporters only export. They never import anything. And here, uh, there's a interesting fact, which I only saw, I think, one or two um, uh, multiple choice question from, uh, which says an ABC transporter something, you don't need to know the name, is responsible for the chloroquine resistance of plasmidium falciparum, which is a protozoa responsible for malaria infection. In case you don't know, chloroquine is a drug given to people, to patients with malaria, which uh, it actually fights with the malaria, uh, with the protozoa responsible for malaria, which its name is uh, plasmodium falciparum. Sometimes this protozoa, the cells, express a specific type of ABC transporter which makes these cells resistant to chloroquine. That is what you need to know. No more. And now let's talk about different type of ABC proteins. Based on their function, ABC proteins are divided into three main groups. Channel type ABC proteins like CFTR, channel regulators like SUR1, and active transporters like multi-drug transporters like PGP, ABCG2, MRP1. We're gonna talk about each of them in detail actually and uh, phosphatidylcholine filipase and oligopeptide transporter in the ER which is TAP1, TAP2. I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't suggest uh, memorizing this one, phosphatidylcholine filipase, because it is not uh, written in the minimals, I didn't see it, and uh, it's not uh, explained more actually in details in the lecture. So in active, in case of active transporters, I would only memorize the first one and the last one. So now let's get to it and first talk about the channel type ABC protein, the example CFTR. Now, CFTR, as we said, is a channel type ABC. What, so if it's a channel, it's a channel for what? It's a channel for chloride ion. So it's a chloride ion channel, and it's expressed, this uh, channel is expressed in the apical membrane of epithelial cells. If you remember, for example, uh, sodium uh, glucose symporter is also expressed in the uh, apical membrane of epithelial cells. Just saying to know where we're exactly talking about. And what happens here is that you, you can see that, again, the two-dimensional uh, structure and the three-dimensional structure. You can see here the ATP binding sites and the transmembrane domains. What happens is a protein, 
called protein kinase A. So it's a kinase, so its job is to phosphorylate. Will come, the, the protein will come, protein kinase A, and phosphorylate this portion, the NBDs, the ATP binding site. And by doing so, well, obviously, we'll have the conformational change, especially first in our domain and then in the whole protein. You can see here, this is the closed form. Then we'll have the conformational change, first in the R domain, then in the whole protein. And by doing so, the protein kinase A will open this uh, CFTR channel. And when the CFTR channel is open, chloride ions will go out down their concentration gradient. So the movement of chloride ion doesn't require energy. It's not an active uh, type of transport, but activation of the uh, protein itself requires ATP. So try to distinguish between them. The protein kinase, uh, the uh, CFTR channel itself requires ATP to be activated, but the uh, chloride ion is not an active move. Uh, the uh, movement of chloride ion is not active. It's going down its concentration gradient. And since this channel is not uh, very uh, selective, the positively charged sodium ions will follow the negatively charged chloride ions out of the cell to the apical domain to the mucus covering to the mucus covering these cells and well will uh, the, the the chloride and sodium concentration will increase the electrolyte concentration of uh, the mucus covering these cells you definitely know what the electrolyte but again electrolytes are uh, these positively and negatively charged ions in an aqueous form. And since we have the chloride and sodium outside the cell, going from inside to outside the cell, well, water, which is inside the cell, will follow these uh, ions via osmosis. So at the end of the whole events, water will also leave the cell. Everything is leaving the cell here, basically. Now, what happens if there's a problem with this CFTR channel? If it is somehow inactivated, if there is an inactivating mutation in its gene that inactivates the channel, what happens is cystic fibrosis. Cystic fibrosis is a multi-organ recessive genetic disorder. What is specific, especially important about cystic fibrosis is that, is that it's multi-organ. So its symptoms will affect gastrointestinal system, lungs, and reproductive system, basically anywhere that we have mucus. So the mucus, because the cystic, uh, uh, CFTR channel is inactivated, the mucus uh, concentration will be altered in the body and it will cause serious infections in the places we have mucus, like lungs, reproductive system, gastrointestinal system, and patients will usually die out of serious lung infections. Now, here you can see that uh, this slide at the end wants to say that chlora and cystic fibrosis, they can uh, promote each other, but we're not, uh, we're not gonna talk about chlora now because we have to talk about it in detail when we reach to the G protein couple receptors. Okay, now it's about the channel regulator type ABC protein. A uh, very good example is SUR1 or KATP. Now, SUR1, as you can see here in this two dimensional depiction, these blue parts are the SUR1 uh, subunits. SUR1 with its pore forming unit KIR6.2 forms the KATP. So SUR1 plus this KIR6.2 forms the KATP, which is 
a ATP sensitive potassium channel. So it is in potassium channel and it is sensitive to ATP. And how it works, we're going to talk about it just right now. But remember that these channels are localized on the plasma membrane of cells of the beta cells of pancreas. So pancreatic beta cells. These channels are there. Now, how these channels work is this. Basically, the first step is that you eat a huge meal and it will be digested, will be turned to glucose and the glucose level in your blood will rise. And as we all know from high school, it's time for insulin to come and to actually promote the formation of glycogen out of these glucose molecules. But how exactly these insulin hormones are going to be released into blood is because, partially because of these KATP uh, channel regulators. Now, how it works is that the glucose levels are high. Pancreatic uh, beta cells will uptake this glucose. The glucose will go into the cell, into the cell metabolism, which means uh, glycolysis, TCA. So the glucose will basically turn to ATP. And as we said, this channel, these uh, KATP channels are ATP sensitive. And that is uh, understandable. Because, as we said, ABC proteins, they have an NBD or ATP binding domain. So they should be sensitive toward the ATP levels. And here is a more, it's a simpler depiction of these channels. So ATP will bind to these channels. And what happens, that is actually important, these channels, when it gets activated, it closes. Why? Because imagine these blue subunits, the SUR1, which are the, the ABC part, when the uh, ATP binds to them, the conformational change actually occurs in a way that these parts exert force on the KIR 6.2 units, and then this force will cause you know, the closure of these uh, of this pore. So, this channel will be closed. And what it usually does, it's a potassium channel. It uh, lets the uh, exit of potassium ions out of the cell. So if this channel is closed now, the potassium ions will remain in the cell. So the cell will be more positive than usual. If the cell is more positive than usual, if you remember from biophysics, what happens is depolarization. Now, depolarization in the cell, in these type of cells, pancreatic beta cells, causes the activation of a specific type of calcium channels, voltage-gated calcium, cha uh, calcium channels in these cells. And when these calcium channels are open, the calcium from out of the cell will rush into the cell. Now the calcium, the excess of calcium in these type of cells again, will cause the vesicles containing insulin. Now these are vesicles in the pancreatic beta cells which contain insulin. It causes the exocytosis of insulin. And what is exocytosis? That's a process in which the vesicles fuse with the plasma membrane and the insulin is now released to the blood. It can go and does whatever it does. But here there's one more thing I just want to mention. You see here that we say KATP channel or calcium uh, channel. So, uh, uh, the direction of the flow of iron flow. What do you think it is? 
is it against or down its concentration gradient? Well, it's definitely down its concentration gradient because ion channels, ion channels are a type of facilitated passive uh, transport. Passive facilitated means that they will, there will be no uh, energy direct, uh, that there will be no energy use, and that the transport will be down the electrochemical potential gradient. Now, what happens if this KATP channel is somehow altered? Now, in, in case of the other channel, we just talked about inactivating mutation. Well, we also have something else, gain of function mutation. Now, you may think, what is the problem with gain of function? But gain of function here doesn't mean it functions well. It means it's always functional. It cannot be disabled. What it means, it means that when the glucose levels rise, when the ATP levels rise, everything is okay in the cell. But ATP, ATP cannot bind with the NBDs on the SUR1. And when it cannot bind with the uh, 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 NBDs on SUR1, what happens is that the, the whole KATP channel cannot be closed. So the potassium will always be leaving the cell. The cell will never get to be that positive to depolarize. And if it doesn't depolarize, the calcium, the voltage gated calcium channels will not open and at the end, insulin will not be secreted. What happens then is diabetes. Completely understandable. In another case, inactivating or loss of function mutation. In loss of function mutation, the ATP, uh, the, the, the channel, which uh, it's, its usual function, the, the usual function of KATP channel is to help the potassium ions to get out of the cell. Now, its function is lost. Uh, it will be always closed. It will not be able to help these potassium uh, ions in the cell to leave. So, if that is the case, the potassium ions will always remain in the cell. The cell will always be depolarized. depolarized and the calcium ions will always rush into the cell and will cause the constant secretion of insulin which causes hypoglycemia you really don't need to know about the in details about these diseases the basic things you already know i think would be enough in this case in case of these channels Let's now talk about P-glycoprotein or PGP. But in order to understand PGP, first we need to talk about the, uh, the phenomenon multidrug resistance. What is multidrug resistance? Multidrug resistance is the resistance of cancer cells to numerous structurally and functionally unrelated anti-cancer agents and how's that how can cancer cells be resistant to a wide variety of unrelated drugs because if they are uh, resistant to one type of drugs it's understandable we say that these type of cancer cells now have uh, become uh, they've developed, of, uh, their genetic material is now a bit different. They can fight against this specific type of drug. But how is that that they will gain this multi-drug resistance? That is because of the expression of certain type of ABC transporters on the membrane, actually overexpression of these ABC transporters on the membrane of cancer cells. And what these ABC transporters do is that they extrude the anti-cancer drugs from the cell before so rapidly that the concentration of these drugs will not reach to a lethal level in the cell. So what they do is they don't let 
the drugs to even be dangerous enough for these cells. That's how they do it, these ABC proteins. And the two big examples that you need to know are P-glycoprotein, PGP, and ABCG2, or breast cancer. Uh, the, the other name for uh, ABCG2 is uh, breast cancer uh, uh, protein. And about PGP, the thing which you should know is that it's right that these uh, proteins, these transporters, are overexpressed on the uh, membrane of cancer cells. But they do exist on the membrane of normal cells, like for example in blood-brain barrier. And it makes sense because that is where we do not want a lot of antibiotics to be. We don't want our brain cells to be damaged by antibiotics. So these uh, transporters exist there. And what they do is that they get rid of dangerous material, which are dangerous for cells, like xenobiotics, uh, uh, like uh, drugs. We don't want them in our brain. And uh, if, for example, we get rid of these in uh, completely, uh, if we knock out the gene which codes for these uh, P-glycoproteins for, uh, and others, we'll have deficiencies in places that we don't want dangerous material to be. For example, blood-brain barrier insufficiency in case of knockout, PGP. But, well, in the other hand, when you have a tumor, these are the ones responsible for the multi-drug resistance of these tumors. So let's now talk about ABCG2, which is, if you remember, another type of transporter involved in the multidrug resistance. So you should by now guess that it has got a wide substrate uh, spectrum overlapping with the PGP. But what this uh, transporter does in uh, normal type of cells is that its job is to get rid of uric acid, which is a dangerous material. And that is good. But when it comes to cancer, especially breast cancer, it will cause the multidrug resistance. So its other name, ABCG2, its other name is breast cancer resistance protein. And that is in case of cancer cells. Its inactivating mutations, loss of function, can also cause an other disease, gout. Gout is when this transporter doesn't work, doesn't function properly, so we'll have uric acid accumulating in certain parts of our tissue. And that is gout, and that is also dangerous. And now, tap one, tap two heterodimer transporter. Now the thing about TAP1, TAP2 is it's a heterodimer, which means that try to visualize that uh, transmembrane, two transmembrane domains, two NBDs we talked about, and uh, divide the whole structure into one transmembrane domain, one TMD, and one ATP binding domain, NBD, for each. So you will have two transmembrane domain and two ATP uh, binding uh, domains on each of uh, these uh, parts. And together they form a monomer, these um, ATP binding domain and transmembrane domain. On each side they form a monomer. And when the whole structure works together, which it needs to work together in order to be working, it is a dimer, and each of these monomers are not like each other, they are different. So it's not a homodimer, but it is a heterodimer. TAP1 is one monomer, TAP2 is the other monomer, and they work together. So TAP1, again, TAP1 has got one 
ATP binding domain, one transmembrane domain. TAP2 has got one uh, transmembrane domain, one ATP binding domain. And this heterodimer transporter is expressed on the membrane of ER. What it does is that we have some endogenous proteins or viral proteins. Endogenous proteins are proteins which are produced by cell itself. Viral proteins are proteins which are the result of the activity of virus. And we will have them in the cell. These proteins will be degraded by the proteasomes. The proteasomes are organelles which we are going to talk about later, but well, basically what they do, as the name suggests, is that they degrade proteins. Now, these oligopeptides, which are formed by the proteasomal degradation, will be transported to the lumen of ER via this TAP1, TAP2 heterodimer transporter. That is what the TAP1, TAP2 does. And when these oligopeptides are in the ER, they will be labeled with this specific label. And then they will be transported, these oligopeptides will be transported to face the extracellular portion of the plasma membrane. So they will be placed in the plasma membrane. And what they do there is that they send signals for, cyto uh, for cytotoxic T cells. So that these uh, cytotoxic T cells recognize that these cells, these cells are, for example, uh, infected with viruses. That is very genius, I think. And then what happens next, we will talk about, about this cell and the cytotoxic T cell. We will talk about them in detail when we reach to the lecture, which is about the cellular immunity. Now, that is about it. Approximately, there's only one more thing. And it's this slide. This slide basically sums up the problems that you'll face in order of each of these ABC proteins get uh, altered in a way. I would not, again, suggest memorizing these two. I never saw them in our exams. I never heard of them coming up in any other exams. Usually when I asked the teachers, they said, well... Uh, I don't know, maybe there's a chance. So if you have extra time, why not do everything? Everything is possible. They may come up in your exam. But these first ones are very important. Study them. Also study the minimals. And see you in the next lecture.